Morning, Calvary. We're going to start a new series in the book of Nehemiah this morning. If we've never met, my name is Thomas and I'm on staff here at the Erie campus. And as some of you know, Excel shut down part of their power grid in Boulder and our Boulder campus was affected. And so perhaps you're joining us from the Boulder campus this morning. Welcome. We're glad that you are here. Calvary is one church in multiple locations, and the Lord has been kind to us this weekend because Pastor Zach, who teaches and leads the Thornton campus, was supposed to preach this morning, but he and Emily had their baby yesterday. So we're excited for them. And then, since the Boulder campus got shut down, Pastor Tom got to go out to Thornton and preach. Thank you, Jesus. All right, so let's pray and let's dedicate this next series and the next season to the Lord. Father, have your way with us. We want to climb onto the potter's wheel again, that you would place your hands on us through your word and the power of your Holy Spirit and continue to shape us and mold us and fashion us to look like your son, Jesus Christ. And so, Father, we devote this next season as we are traveling through a new book, a new story that's your story. Help us find ourselves in it. Help us see you in it. And help us begin to trust you more and more. We pray this in the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. All right, we're going to go to the book of Nehemiah. So if you have your Bible, that's in the Old Testament. So if you haven't been around Nehemiah lately, it's about a third of the way in. So if you go start in the beginning as Genesis, you start flipping right, you're going to get through the first five books. Exodus is in there, Deuteronomy, Numbers, Leviticus, get through 1st and 2nd Samuel, 1st and 2nd Kings, 1st and 2nd Chronicles, then you're going to hit Ezra, and then Nehemiah. This is part of the story of Israel. And before we just jump into Nehemiah and start looking at what he said, we should ask ourselves, who is he? Where is he in the story of God? Because we don't want to just parachute into the Bible and just grab texts that sound good and apply them to our life. We want to know the context of these books. We want to know where Nehemiah is in the story. And so I'm going to tra- we're going to spend a little bit of time kind of leading up, framing this story as we look at the story of Israel. Now, I won't go all the way to the beginning with Genesis. Genesis is the beginning story of God's creation, of God calling a family. Abraham is the father of it that's going to become Israel. He has 12 sons, become the 12 tribes of Israel, and we know that they go to Egypt. And one of the stories that maybe most people are familiar with in popular culture is that Israel was enslaved in Egypt for 400 years. And then there was a character named Moses, and Moses was God's chosen instrument to bring them out of slavery. This is what's called Exodus. They're going to exit slavery, and they're going to go into the wilderness And then they're going to be prepared as a people, as a nation, to enter the promised land. A land that's flowing with milk and honey. A land that's going to allow their families to settle into it, to own properties and houses and flourish there. And so the story goes, as the family of God comes out of Egypt, through the wilderness, out of of the exodus, into the promised land, they come in and they lived happily ever after. (laughs) No, that's how fairy tales end. This is reality. This is real life. This is life that you and I live. And there are even consequences for coming into the land. And then they continue to trust God sometimes and not trust God sometimes. So I want to pick up the story as they've come into the land in a time known as the Judges. So we're going to throw up a timeline and we're going to begin around 1300 BC or BCE, whichever way you want to go. It's either before Christ or before the Christ era, whichever way you want to look at it. That's a joke. The whole thing hinges on Jesus Christ. So here we are, about 1,300 years before Christ, and they're in the land, and they have no king. All the other countries around them have kings, and they are ruled by judges, and judges come when the people are disobedient, and God brings judgment on the people, and then they cry out to God and say, God, we're so sorry. Please rescue us from the Canaanites. Please rescue us from the Philistines, and then he would centralize leadership in a judge, and you know some of these famous judges, like Deborah was a famous judge. She was awesome. Uh, You know, Samson, he's questionable. You know, Gideon, really cool story of the 300. 
The last of the 12 judges is a man named Samuel. And Samuel's the last judge. And at that time, the people make their first fundamental movement to reject God as their ultimate leader. And they say, God, look at all these other countries. They all have kings. Like having a king was very trending. And they said, man, we want, we want to be trending with all the, cool, all the cool kids. We want a king. And God says, no, I'm your king. And Samuel tells him, no, we have God who brought us out of Egypt, who took us through the wilderness, who fed us, who cared for us, who protected us, who has provided all of this for us. We don't need a king. And they say, thank you. We want a king. And so they get this first king, Saul. And Saul is a man's man. The Bible says he stands a foot above all the other men. They're like children. He's hairy on his chest and on his back. I mean, this guy is a dude, (laughs) except that his heart was far from God. And he didn't trust God. And he didn't humble himself before God. And so God rejects Saul and he appoints a new king, David, because David is a shepherd. David will be a shepherd king, the kind of king that God will one day bring in Jesus Christ, a shepherd king. And, and David is really not really known, even thought of as a king. Even in fact, when, when Samuel comes to appoint a new king and he's at this household with all of David's brothers, his dad doesn't even think about bringing David out. David's out in the field with the sheep. Well, then Samuel anoints David. His heart is towards God. He's not perfect. He makes a lot of mistakes, but his heart is towards God. And he becomes the king of Israel following Saul. And then David is going to have one king, or have a son who will be the last king of the United Kingdom. Of his name is Solomon, and Solomon builds the temple. And this is the end of what's called the United Kingdom. It means north and south are together. After Solomon, there's a civil war, and the civil war results in the kingdom being split into two. It's no longer united. So think of if the South won our civil war. We wouldn't be the United States of America. We'd be divided north and south. That's what happens in Israel. And two of the 12 tribes stay south in Jerusalem. That's Judah and that is Benjamin. And then the northern tribes are the other 10 tribes and they have its own leadership. And you start tracing the kings. And in the north, there are 19 kings that come and they're really, really wicked. And God says it's prophets to the northern kingdom to say, come back to me. You've embraced idols other gods. You've gone after cultural trends and brands that were never for you. And then you have forsaken the things that I've called you to, to be the people of God. Things like justice and mercy, to plead the case of the widow and the orphan, to take care of the sojourner. You've forsaken those things and your worship has become empty and you've given your hearts to another. Come back to me. Well, they refuse to come back to God. And so he sends, a pro- he sends prophets from time to time to different leadership saying, if you refuse to repent and come back to me, I'm going to bring judgment on you. I'm going to discipline you because you're my children. And like a loving father, a loving mother would do, I'm going to bring discipline to you. And I'm going to remove you from this land of promise and you will be scattered amongst the nations. Well, they refuse to listen. And so Assyria, the powerhouse of the day, <clears throat> comes in and brings them out of the northern part of the kingdom, the promised land, and takes them out into what's called exile. This is captivity in which they will serve another government. They will be removed from their houses and their families, the pastures of their sheep, the orchards that they have planted. Now, at the same time, the southern kingdom, they have 20 leaders, 19 kings and one queen, and and they have good kings and bad kings, good leadership and bad leadership. And over the time, the, the people's hearts are towards God and away from God. And when the people's hearts are away from God, he sends a prophet to the leadership that says, don't do what your northern brothers and sisters did. Return to me. Remember my ways of justice. Don't pervert justice. Care for the poor, the widow, the immigrant the sojourner amongst you. Don't forsake the ways of God. Don't trade God, the living God, for idols of the Canaanites or the, or the Philistines. Well, eventually, after 20 leaders in the south, they too are going into exile. The Babylonians are going to take them there. Now, one of the prophets that's speaking to the southern kingdoms is a prophet by the name of Jeremiah. Jeremiah comes and he warns them because of their disobedience and unwillingness to come back to God, they're going into exile and they're going to go for a specific period of time. There's hope, even in discipline, that it will end after 70 years. 
This is Jeremiah chapter 25, speaking to the leadership in the south. Verse 20, chapter 25, verse 8, Jeremiah says, Therefore, thus says the Lord of hosts, because you have not obeyed my words, behold, I will send for all the tribes of the north, declares the Lord, and for Nebuchadnezzar, the king of Babylon, my servant, and I will bring them against this land and its inhabitants and against all these surrounding nations. I will devote them to destruction and make them a horror, a hissing, and an everlasting desolation. Verse 11, this whole land shall become a ruin and a waste, and these nations shall serve the king of Babylon 70 years. So they're removed from their place of promise, of life, and they're going to go a place of captivity and exile. Have you ever been in a place in your life where based on the decisions that you've made has gotten you somewhere you never wanted to be? And because of some of those decisions, it feels like you are trapped and there is no way that you can get back home. There's no way you can return to that marriage There's no way you can return to the family, friends, work, community. Have you ever been in a place in which you remember how it was? Like God was saying, this is not for you. You don't want to make these decisions. You have like this conscience, which is a gift from God to try to push the brakes, but you refuse to listen. And because of your appetites and desires, you got yourself somewhere you never thought you could be. And you long to get home, and it feels like you are in captivity. This would be a description of your own life. The land has become a ruin and waste. Like my life has become ruined and waste. Is there any hope for renewal? Is there any hope to be restored, to be back in a place of life and promise? This is the story of Nehemiah. This is the story of God's people. Verse 12, then after 70 years are completed, I will punish the king of Babylon and that nation, the land of the Chaldeans, for their iniquity declares the Lord, making the land an everlasting waste. I will bring upon that land all the words that I have uttered against it, everything written in this book, with which Jeremiah prophesied against all the nations. So I'll bring judgment on Babylon, though right now they're my chosen servant to discipline my people. And so they go into captivity. So we go back to our timeline. Just like the prophet said, in their disobedience, the south is now moved into captivity. And they are, they're wondering that question. Based on the decisions we've made, is there any way to get back home? We wish we could go back in time and make different decisions. We can't. Has God given up on us? Is there any way to be renewed. Well, at this time, as it's closing down in Babylon, there's a famous captive. We've looked at the story before of Daniel. Daniel is in Babylon. He was one of the captives taken, and he has lived under many dynasties. Nebuchadnezzar was the first one, and, and he has seen God work even in the midst of captivity through his people and his faithfulness. And God has reminded him of Jeremiah's promise that they would be in exile, but they would be in there for only 70 years. And they're approaching 70 years. And I think, I think Daniel's hope is up. Like, is God real? Is God trustworthy? Can God be trusted that what he said will come to pass? And there's another prophet at this time, a prophet that came way before this time, 150 years before this moment, that foretold of a future leader and named him by name before he was ever born that he would be favorable to the Jews in captivity and restore them back to the land. This was a prophet by the name of Isaiah who prophesied to the northern kingdom and was prophesying way before they even went into captivity. And he said, there's going to come a leader in due time that will be favorable to my people that's going to bring them back into the land of promise. His name is Cyrus. Now imagine this. This is like somebody in 1874 saying, hey, there's a future leader, a leader of one of the greatest empires the world has ever seen. His name is Joe Biden. And it's like, write this down. And it's like, who's Joe Biden? I don't know, never heard of him. All right, just put his name in the book. 
God's going to use him. He's going to use him as an instrument. Just imagine that. And then the decades happen. And then this leader who God has named appears on the scene and appears at the right time in the right place. This is Isaiah 45 verse 1. Isaiah said, thus says the Lord to his anointed, to Cyrus, whose right hand I have grasped to subdue nations before him and to loose the belt of kings to open doors before him that gates may not be closed. Verse four, for the sake of my servant Jacob and Israel, my chosen, God says, I call you by your name, Cyrus. I name you, though you do not know me. I am the Lord and there is no other. Besides me, there is no God. I equip you, though you do not know me. I've equipped you to do the very purpose of God and I've named you even though you don't worship me. So we're talking about a foreign king who is named before he is born, before he's a thought in his great grandfather's mind. So at this time, Daniel is in exile, back to our timeline. The South is in exile. It's been nearly 70 years. And they have this king, Belshazzar. This is the last king of Babylon. His father is out fighting the Persians. You know who's leading the Persians? Cyrus. And Belshazzar throws himself this big, huge, drunken party. And there's this writing on the wall. Do you remember this story? This is where that phrase comes, the writing's on the wall. And the writing on the wall is, your kingdom, Belshazzar, Babylon, is over tonight. And you know who invades that very night? Is the Persians under Cyrus. And they conquer the Babylonians. And here's Daniel who's lived through all of these different empires, all these different leaders, some who have turned back to God, some who refuse to. And there's Daniel remembering after 70 years, as Jeremiah promised, we're going back to the land. It's almost 70 years. And as Isaiah promised, there's a king coming named Cyrus who God has named, who's going to be gracious to us. And I can just see as Cyrus comes in, Daniel's like, right on time, (laughs) right on time. Hey, hey, king, your name is, was written in this book. And he is favorable to the Jews. And so there begins a return from exile. So Cyrus takes over in 539. And he gives out this decree that the Jews may return in, cer- in certain measure back to the land and begin to rebuild. And so a rebuilding, a returning campaign begins. And there are three leaders in this campaign. Zerubbabel is the first and then Ezra, and then Nehemiah. In many old manuscripts, Ezra and Nehemiah, which are two books in your Bible, is actually one, just one story of the return under these three leaders. And Zerubbabel is the first one to come back, and Zerubbabel rebuilds the temple. That's the first place to rebuild. What got us out is our lack of worship, our lack of following God. And so the first place to rebuild is the worship center of Israel. And so he leads the rebuilding of the worship center. Then Ezra comes back and he reinstitutes the law. He reads it in the worship center and reinstitutes the ways of God. And then Nebuchadnezzar, or sorry, then Nehemiah is going to follow and he is going to rebuild the wall. What protects them from invasion, from the neighbors who harass them, who bother them, that leave them vulnerable? And so these are the three leaders over time in which are coming out of exile, being in a land that is not their own, working for foreign governments that are not their own, longing from this place based on decisions that they and their families have made, wondering, can we ever go back home? Will we ever be renewed as the people of God? Now, in this return, there's another figure that is worthy to mention. Maybe you know the story of Esther. Esther is a Jewish woman who gets appointed as the queen because the queen Vashti refuses to do some perverted things that her husband wants her to do. And so her husband gets rid of her. He's one of the kings in the Persian Medo Empire and takes Queen Esther as his queen. Well, she's the stepmother of Vashti's third son, Artaxerxes, who is the king at the time of Nehemiah. And so perhaps from the faithfulness of Esther, preparing the heart of Vesti's children, of her stepchildren, their heart is soft towards the living God and the people who follow the living God. And so it is in this household that we find Nehemiah working. So let's go to Nehemiah chapter one. You guys like some background, that, all that background? 
You're welcome. I read some books this week. <laughs> that was just top of head, actually. I think about it all the time. <laughs> Nehemiah chapter 1. I'm going to read the chapter, and then we're going to really pull this apart next week. So in exile, working for the foreign governments, Nehemiah writes this. The words of Nehemiah, the son of Hekeliah. Now it happened in the month of Kislev, which is November, December. In the 20th year, as I was in Susa, the citadel, that's the same place as Esther, who had been there, that Hanani, one of my brothers, came with certain men from Judah, and I asked them concerning the Jews who escaped, who had survived the exile, and concerning Jerusalem. And they said to me, the remnant there in the province who had survived the exile is in great trouble and shame. The wall of Jerusalem is broken down and its gates are destroyed by fire. So here's Nehemiah. Here's people coming back from Jerusalem. How's it going? People have come back from exile under Zerubbabel, under Ezra. How are the people doing? How are the families doing? And the word is not well. It doesn't look like much of a renewal project has happened. Things are not good. And he addresses the wall. The wall that keeps out foreigners, aggressors, is not built. It lays in ruins. The great city is in a state of being vulnerable. And when Nehemiah hears this, this is his response. Verse 4, as soon as I heard these words, I sat down and wept and mourned for days. And I continued fasting and praying before the God of heaven. And I said, O Lord, God of heaven, the great and awesome God who keeps covenant and steadfast love with those who love him and keep his commandments, let your ear be attentive and your eyes open to hear the prayer of your servant that I now pray before you day and night for the people of Israel, your servants, confessing the sins of the people of Israel, which we have sinned against you. Even I and my father's house have sinned. We have acted very corruptly against you and have not kept the commandments, the statutes, the rules that you commanded your servant Moses. Remember the word that you commanded your servant Moses saying, if you are unfaithful, I will scatter you among the peoples. But if you return to, to me and keep my commandments and do them, though your outcasts are in the uttermost parts of heaven, from there I will gather them and bring them to the place that I have chosen to make my name dwell there. They are your servants and your people whom you have redeemed by your great power and by your strong hand. O Lord, let your ear be attentive to the prayer of your servant and to the prayer of your servants who delight to fear your name and give success to your servant today and grant him mercy in the sight of this man. Now I was the cupbearer of the king. His role is to be pals with the king to taste the king's wine before he drank it, to eat the king's food before he ate it. So he's in a place in which he's not threatened. He's in a place that's secure. He lives in the palace. He's drinking the nicest wines. I mean, not this box wine, black box. He's drinking like Camus. (laughs) He's having the nicest foods. And yet when he hears about his brothers and sisters... He sits down and weeps and mourns for days for the renewal of his people has not yet happened. Now, I just gave you a whole bunch of dates and names on a timeline that perhaps you've never heard before, places you've never thought about or seen, at dates that feel like forever ago. But this is what I know is true of every single person in this room. You have a timeline, and it has dates on there that you know very well, and there are names on your timeline that have unforgettable stories, and there are places on your timeline that have shaped you, and many of us in this room, those dates and names and places Remind us of the decisions we made that have gotten us to the place where we are, wishing we could just get back home. Though you might not know Israel's story, you know your story. 
And as they sat in exile, you sit in this place of ruin and you wonder, is there any chance of renewal for me? Has God abandoned me? Have I so ruined this that he wouldn't be kind towards me? And you're offering up prayers, maybe, like Nehemiah. And so I want to begin this whole study from where Nehemiah begins. If you are in a place you don't want to be, and you wonder, is there any chance of renewal for me? I want want to tell you, this is the beginning. You begin where Nehemiah began. And the place you have to begin is this, reality. You have to begin with the things as they really are. He begins with the reality. This is what we have done. I'm guilty. My father's guilty. He doesn't try to excuse it. He doesn't doesn't try to shift the blame on somebody else. He takes ownership for decisions that have been made. And he faces the reality, the circumstances of where he is. The reason that many people will never experience renewal is because they will never face reality. And so the very first thing you must come to grips with is the reality of your circumstance. What decisions have you made? Own up to it. What things have happened? Recognize it. Well, we, that's what we would call confession here. We would confess those things. We would admit those things. If you can't begin with reality, we can't move forward. The second thing, if you want renewal in your life, so you start with reality and then you turn to God. You turn to God. Now, why would you turn to God? It's because of who he is. See, this story of Nehemiah is actually not about Nehemiah. It's all about God. One of the things that evangelicals are at fault for is taking the the stories of the Old Testament, these great women and great men, and then we make them the heroes. No, they're characters, like we're characters in the story. They make faults, they do things that are good, like we make faults and do things that are good. But the whole thing is to what? Put your eyes on God. God is the hero of all these stories. And so here in Nehemiah chapter 9, this is who God is. This is who God of renewal is. This is who Nehemiah is praying to, confessing his reality to. This is chapter 9, verse 17. But you are a God ready to forgive. That's who he is. Ready to forgive. Gracious and merciful. Slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love. And did not forsake them, and he will not forsake you. That's who God is. So if you desire, from wherever you are, to experience renewal, to be brought back to a place of promise, of rest, you might call home, it begins with two things. Confessing reality and turning to God. For God is the one who forgives, who is gracious and is merciful. You know your story. You know the people. You know the dates. You know the places. And if you're somewhere you never wanted to be, and it feels like there's no way to get back home, you got to join us for Nehemiah. This is, the restore, this is the story of God's people admitting reality and turning to the God who forgives and is gracious and merciful, the God of renewal. This is why we celebrate communion. This is the greatest story. It's all leading to Christ to resurrect us, to forgive us of our sins, to conquer death, and ultimately make all renewal possible. To have Christ in your life is to have us in a stream flowing towards renewal and life eternal forever. And so if you're helping with communion, would you come down, take your seats, Communion is a time in which we remember the work of Jesus Christ, his life, death, and resurrection. What he came to accomplish, what he accomplished in history, space, and time for us. For God so loved the world that he gave us his only son. That so whosoever would believe in him, trust him, follow him, would not perish, but have what? Eternal life. Their life renewed eternally. And so what we do right now at the Lord's table is what? We confess, we admit our reality. We confess our decisions, 
the ways in which we, just like Israel, have not followed the ways, the voice of God. We confess where we are and we admit our need for him. Let's do that now. Father, we come before you knowing that we approach you in grace because of Jesus. And so, Lord, may we respond like Nehemiah responded, to sit down and weep over our realities. To confess to you what we have done. To refuse to hide it, excuse it, ignore it. And then, Lord, we ask you to be who you are to us, forgiving, gracious, and merciful. Would you cleanse us from all of our sin and remove it from us as far as the east is from the west and renew us once again as your people. In the mighty name of Jesus, we pray. Amen.